Hey everyone, and welcome to The Kodakery. I'm Megan. And I'm Josh. This week we talked to Mark Rasso, director of the new film Kodachrome. A story about the last photo lab to process Kodachrome, this film was aptly shot on 35mm. We talked to Mark about directing his second feature, about shooting on film, and getting your dream cast. So, let's jump into The Kodakery and talk with Mark. Hey everybody, welcome to The Kodakery. Today in The Kodakery, Megan and I are thrilled to welcome director Mark Razzo of the new film Kodachrome. Mark, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Mark, this is your second full-length kind of uh, feature narrative. Um, the first one, Copenhagen, you wrote on your own. This one, mm-hmm. how, how did this script come to you? Like, how, how does this end up in your inbox or on your desk? Um, it's a good question. I, the, I guess the long story is I, uh, I, I made Copenhagen out of film school, and you're kind of taught in film school to have your short and have your first feature ready to go which I did, and I kind of did successfully. And then after Copenhagen came out, I was looking uh, to do something else, and I hadn't had anything that I'd written. So my agent and Amanda were kind of looking for stuff, you know, no disrespect to writers out there, but stuff in the image that I would have written or, you know, topical to me, mm-hmm. specific to me. So I got this script as a, as a new father. My son was six months old uh, when when I received it, and... You know, I read it, and there's a passage in the film that talks about just kind of holding holding your, your child and feeding them at night and how, you know, you'd like to live in that moment and kind of really connected with me and also being at the stage where I am was starting to, to grapple with this idea of, you know, before then, you know, work was everything, and now it's kind of how do I split work and family time, having a family, being a, being a parent. So... When the script came to me, it came to me from executive who who had liked my short film under and liked Copenhagen, and thought I'd be right for it. I immediately jumped on it and um, you know aggressively went after it and ended up getting the project. That's great. So, like Josh had said, Copenhagen you wrote, um, but what was it like to to take somebody else's story that was written? and then take it from there. Did you get to rework the script at all a little bit, or did you just take it as it was? What was that process like? Uh, the script needed needed to be adjusted. I mean, I think, you know, 95% of what was in the script is, is in the movie, but it needed to be adjusted in the sense that it was originally written, conceived as a, a much bigger film. Um, it was written for Fox, and, you know, we, we took it out of Fox and made it as this little indie independent film. So when I came on board, what I wanted to do, and I think it's what, what the producers wanted to do and why they were interested in me as the director is they wanted to ground it and kind of make it feel real and and um, and, and, and and allow these characters to, you know, become like any of us. And, and in addition to that, the Elizabeth Olsen's character, you know, we, we also did a lot of work on that, along with the actors, to kind of make it fit into the themes of the film, um, the, these ideas of, of forgiveness. Forgiveness was a big theme in the film, and we wanted her kind of arc to fit into that as well. So there was some work, but, you know, a lot of credit needs to go to the writer, Jonathan Tropper, because it was kind of, it was all there. It was all on the page. Excellent. And, and so for the audience out there, it's a road trip, a father-son road trip across the country, and that he's taking Kodachrome film to the last lab, um, that's still processing the film to get it developed. And, and a huge part of the film is about celluloid, is about film, and we here at Kodak are big fans. Um, <laughs> and, and so what was your relationship with film before? Have you shot a lot of film before? Like, what, what, have you used it a lot? Like, in terms of that, that kind of aspect of it, um, what was your relationship like with, with film? Well, when I was just starting out... Um kind of when I decided, like, this is something I want to do and, and was focusing on it, I had uh, I had worked with, like, a little Bell & Howell camera, 16 millimeter, shot a bunch of stuff, black and white. My first couple shorts were shot on, on 16. I had never touched 35, but it's a, it, it in itself was a process, and and it just suddenly became much easier to make your little shorts, your exercises, which are they're basically exercises to hone and learn your craft on digital. So I kind of went that way and um, continued to go that way and kind of film, in all honesty, had been forgotten um, for me. It was always a dream at one point to shoot on 35, but I just 
didn't think it was going to happen. So when we got the opportunity to shoot this film on 35, man, I was so great. I was so <laughs> grateful for it and and just uh, thrilled, thrilled to be able to do it and hope to be able to continue to do it in the future. But yeah, so that was my relationship. I think it's it's very similar to, you know, a lot of kind of people who go to the film school route. You know, it's just hard. It's just hard to feasibly do it at a young age. But I do think when you get to a point in your career, if you get to a point in your career where you can make these choices, then I kind of feel the responsibility is to start bringing it back to film. How did that decision, this was shot on 35 millimeter, how did that decision come about? Who sort of brought that in? I know you worked with Alan Poon as the cinematographer for this. You'd worked with him before. I don't know if he had something to do with it. How did that, how did the conversation begin? You know, with everything, I I want to make sure I'm making the right decision and not jump to anything. So me and Alan debated film and digital for the context of the story. Uh, The story is about the death of a certain type of film. So we wondered, does it make sense that you know, we're, we're shooting it on, right. we're shooting it with what kind of replaced it. Or do we want to kind of stay true to the, Ben's character, to the artistic merits of what we're trying to say and shoot it on film? And quickly we landed on that, the second aspect. Then it became an issue of, okay, getting everyone on board. Luckily, everyone got on board very quickly. Um, and, you know, Alan was thrilled because Alan had shot uh, the, um had used film more than I had, so he, he, you know, he was well practiced in it. So when we made the decision, the one thing that we didn't want, we didn't want it to feel uh, sentimental or nostalgic. Um, I wasn't going for like a, a '70s look. I was going for this kind of, you know, it is a period piece. It takes place in 2010, but I was going for a, a very kind of contemporary look. So. What we ended up doing was we balanced, you know, the film stock by choosing to shoot on um, Zeiss Master Primes, which are kind of newer, cleaner glass. We shot on the Airy Cam as opposed to the Panavision. So we wanted to find that balance. We wanted mm-hmm. to, to feel sharp and modern, but we still want to have the aesthetics of film. When you're shooting on uh, film versus digital, like how does that impact the set, the cast, the crew? For me, I think, you know, we, you can argue aesthetics all day long and people will land on both sides of it. Um, I do believe film aesthetically looks stronger, feels different, but me otherwise, what the biggest impact, I won't say the biggest impact, but a very big impact it had was actually on the day, mm-hmm. what it meant. Um, and, you know, for people who aren't uh, directors, filmmakers, I liken it to, to taking a picture, uh, you know, with a film camera or a digital camera and the preparation involved and the attention to detail involved when you take it with a film camera, when you have a limited number and when everything has to be right, rather than let me just shoot off 20 photos and choose one later. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what it was for me. It was everyone on set was dialed in uh, present, which is huge. I mean, you always want people to be present, but unfortunately you you can look around film sets and you find people on their phones and doing stuff and whatever. On this set, everyone was dialed in because we knew we had to get it. And we didn't have playback on the film and our our kind of uh, video village was standard definition. So it wasn't giving us the true image. So we had to trust that we were getting it. So everyone had to be on the top of their game and we wouldn't see it for two days. We had to send the film out to Montreal. We shot in Toronto, you know, way a day before we saw the dailies. And by that time we were at a different set. So nothing could be done anyway. So. Right. So what it did is it brought a presence to everyone. It brought uh, an immediacy to it. And I really, really strongly believe it just raised everyone's game. And we've heard in the past, you know, goes all the way up to the cast. Leading to the next question, you had a fantastic cast as well that you worked with, Ed Harris, Jason Sudeikis. And we wondered if you could tell us a little as the director about the casting process. Were you involved in that process? Yeah, yeah. I was... uh definitely involved that when the script came to me there was no cast attached to it mm-hmm. so when i was reading it you know originally the the ben character was well you could read it as a little bit more of an eccentric character and i guess i wanted to ground him just reading it so i started reading it in ed harris's voice to do that <laughs> uh which is odd so 
um, when I went in, when I went in for my presentation, you know, I put a picture of Ed Harris there as Ben. And uh, when I got the job, and they said, "Who do you want to go to for Ben?" I said, "Ed Harris." So, so <laughs> and you yeah, got him. I mean, yeah, and we got him. It, it normally doesn't happen that way, uh, I'm told, and in, in my experience. But in this case, it happened that way, and we got him, and and he jumped on board, and we got it, and Jason had had read the script before my involvement and really liked it. So the producers brought him up to me and, uh, and I met with him and I was, you know, I, I was like, he knows this isn't a comedy <laughs> this <is> a drama. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, Jason's looking to do more dramatic work. And we met and Jason's a photographer. He's a, he's a really wonderful, uh, stills photographer. I mean, his portfolio is amazing. He shoots on film all the time and, and, he he loves it and he's so knowledgeable about it and where he was at the time was very similar place his son was the same age as my son they're born a week apart we're both new fathers came into it looking at it exactly the same and it was just very very easy he's also like a very smart guy very dedicated understands everything so um i you know it's, it's not spo- it's really not supposed to happen this way but it happened <laughs> <laughs> it, it happened quite easy and and nice, and you know, we all just kind of shared the same vision. Same with Elizabeth. I mean, she was the first person we went out to for for the Zoe character, and she liked it and came on board. So, so yeah, it, uh, yeah, it just it just worked out. So, so I mean, Ed Harris himself is an extremely talented director. He's an amazing actor. I mean, he's one of my favorites. Like, I, I so did, what was it like working yeah. with somebody like that? Did you learn a lot from him? Like, how how does that dynamic work? for you as maybe a newer director working with a seasoned veteran like Ed Harris? Sure. I mean, it's a good question. I, you know, you go into it. I go in, I went into it wanting to be as respectful as possible uh, to his process. And, you know, you work on it slowly and you build trust. I, you know, I would ask him in meetings before we started shooting, I asked him a ton about his process on, um, well, maybe not his process, his experience on, on Pollock and Appaloosa and, you know, directing. Um, I think one of the things that Ed understood early was that, you know, for me, this film is about performances and I was going to do whatever I could to allow him to do what he needed to do. And he, uh, he appreciated that and respect that. And we, we got along great and he was just very supportive of me, which I really appreciated. And, you know, I was tremendously thrilled to, you know, that, that experience with him and Jason and Elizabeth, I mean, all of them was one that I'll cherish and I learned so much from. Yeah, it's just really about earning each other's respect and trust. And you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the theme of forgiveness and how you said with the script, you sort of worked with the actors a little bit in, um, Mm -hmm. especially in um, Elizabeth's role. Did you actually rework the script a little bit with their input? Yeah, exactly. We just tried, we just tried to find things that that made sense um and gave them you know gave them the the, the best place to kind of go as a character and and, and the, you know allowed allowed them to really sink their teeth into it and feel it and it was mostly with Elizabeth it was just a little bit of the backstory mm-hmm. a little a little bit less um victim and and maybe more victim victimizer i guess you know flipping her character we kind of just flipped her character into not something who someone who had had stuff done to her, but someone who had done stuff to kind of find herself in the place that she is, um, and that that was the big thing. We both felt really strong about it, and uh, you know, Jason with Jason and Ed, it was it's mostly all there. It's mostly all in the script. It's, it's details. It's things here and there, mm-hmm. just things that make them feel like they can get into it more and understand it more and you know i'm always open i mean it's easier now it's easier when i hadn't written the script but even on copenhagen when i hadn't written the script you know i'm always open to actor suggestions i always want them to take over the character and make it theirs um you know as a director your your job is huge and you can't micromanage everything and if you when you have talented people who are willing to do that it doesn't matter if they need to change details here and there you let them go with it yeah yeah, yeah. And uh, you got some amazing performances out of the actors. I mean, that Ed Harris and Jason Sudeikis, um, that some of those scenes toward the end of the film, really, really powerful. And and is that a matter of like when those two guys are, are, are 
you see that chemistry happening? Or are you just like, okay, I'm going to step back and just let this happen? <laughs> or, I mean, how, how are you in some of those really, like, I would say emotional scenes, like how do you either insert yourself or when do you know to be like, no, no, I'm just, they're, they've got it. I'm, I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> you know, I try to, I try to let them take it as far as they can take it. Um, and oftentimes that feels good enough and you move on. And when it doesn't feel good enough, it's just try to keep it as simple as possible. The simplest note or adjustment just to kind of push it over the top. But when you're dealing with people as talented as there are, you know, it's, it's just really finding the right balance. It's all, it's very, I find it's very delicate, you know, it's all, it's all very, very delicate and, and just offering support and knowing that I trust hope, hopefully they know that I trust them to do what they're doing and just making sure the camera's in the right place to capture what they're doing. Um, you know, that's the other part of the job. This film was actually sold at Toronto film festival to Netflix, correct? Mm-hmm. And so what kind of, yes. an Im- what, what kind of an impact did Netflix purchasing that film have on its release and it's where it took off from, from the film festival? You know, it's hard. It's hard for me to really know because we made right. this film without distribution, so it could have gone right. many different ways. Um, True. <laughs> I just know that. Yeah, like you know, I just don't know what the options were, but it was one of it was one of their bigger purchases. That I think it was actually their biggest purchase at Toronto, and and what it, you know, they've been great. Obviously, as a filmmaker, you'd like it to be in theaters as much as it can. They are doing a theatrical release in the U.S., which is great. Uh, In other countries, that's going straight to their platform. For me, I'm grateful that their 100,000-plus subscribers, 100 million-plus subscribers around the world, you know, and that's just subscribers. That's that's not really like the, the... five family members on every yeah, that's true right. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah so you know paid subscribers are getting a chance uh to see the work because that's why you make films you make films to be seen so you know it's it's a little bit bittersweet because obviously you'd like it to be in theaters as much as possible but the reality is people aren't going to theaters as much as they used to and you know if people probably if people were going to theaters as much as they used to it would be on more screens but it is on the number of screens it is. I'm grateful for it. And I'm, I'm also really, really happy that so many people are going to get the opportunity to see the film. Yeah. And it's something that we talk about on the show a lot and even just amongst each other because I think there's, on one hand, of course you want it to be in the theater. And I, like, I love going to the theater. I love that experience. But I know that for me as a, as a viewer, I've also discovered filmmakers through Netflix. I wouldn't have gotten to see that film mm-hmm. in theater theaters and like i think of uh mudbound which was one that i just recently saw and absolutely loved and uh i think the director's name is Dee Rees. i'll be looking for her next film for sure and making sure that i see it you know yeah. and 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 so it's really an interest I'm, I'm curious how do you see it impacting the independent film industry like do you see it as a as a major positive or do you see it as it's too early to decide like and not just netflix but like the streaming services and these new studios that are coming up as a as an independent filmmaker what impact do you see in the i don't know five years from now the the kind of the movie business you know there's arguments for both sides i know from personal experience when i shot copenhagen which was a micro budget film without any distribution in place without knowing without really knowing if it would just end up in like my office drawer or <laughs> or people would see it, you know, at that point. Um, and you're, you're doing, you're doing um, crowdfunding and, and self-financing parts and calling in favors and just, you know, trying to get a film made. And that's a lot of people who I went to school with or young filmmakers, that's how they make movies. It's like passion and it takes years to do something like Netflix or Amazon, or, or all these digital things, it's a, it's a godsend. I mean, it's just, it's just a way for people to see your film, and without it, you know, no, like, uh, Copenhagen's on Netflix, and I get uh, messages and emails and tweets and all the time from people who've liked it, seen it, appreciated it, that I just know wouldn't be out there. So, so, so coming from that place, which is, like, pretty much, I think, like, the 99% of filmmakers out there you know it's i think it's wonderful um on the artistic side on the financial side i don't know i'm not sure 
how you recoup money, you know, on these services when you're making films, independent films without without recognizable cast. It's a whole different ball game. I think I think the theatrical kind of way that people are arguing for it is for the one percent out there who can dictate terms, who can get any actors they want and kind of do their thing. I don't think it's a realistic model moving forward. I just you know, that's not really the way the majority of filmmakers are are making their films. So I, I'm appreciative for it. I think it's I think it's wonderful, but I can't you know, I can't speak for the finances. I can just speak for the artist getting their work seen. Right. So you have produced, directed, and written, and I and mm-hmm. I wondered at this point in your career, you know, is directing where you see things moving from here? I know you also have Fidelio, which is a production company that you're a part of. What is, I don't want to say what's your favorite, but what right now is, is um, where you see yourself heading next? For me, it, it's really about just telling meaningful stories and I'm right. I, I'm continuing to write. Mm-hmm. So I love writing. I want to direct what I write. I'm also continuing to look for projects that I haven't written. At the same time at Fidelio, we are trying to produce, you know, we're trying to produce people's films, people's stories, uh, stories we believe in, stories we think are important. It, I think it's all, it's all very, very important. It's very important to support other filmmakers um, coming up behind you, so to speak, and get voices of interest out there. So, you know, I don't, I love being on set, so probably directing is my favorite, but whether that's directing uh, my own script or someone else's script, you know, it doesn't matter. I think directing your own script, it's a little bit more personal, so it's a little bit more interesting. Um, But writing is extremely hard. It's just a hard (laughs) thing to do. Um, So, you know, it's not always, it takes time to get that script that you want. I've just written one with my brother that I'm really, really happy about and hopefully get to make that. But there's also another project that I've, that I've attached myself to that I didn't write that I'm very excited about. And then, you know, at Fidelio, we have three or four films that we're trying to get made. So, I, I call myself a filmmaker, and I just want to I just want to tell stories of meaning in any way I can. Right, right. Got a lot of options. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I'm curious, how how has producing, writing, and directing made you better at each one of those tasks? If that makes sense, right? So, how has producing made you a better director? How has directing made you a better writer? Like, do these things inform each other? I no, I think they absolutely inform each other creatively i mean writing directing editing are are all come down to to basically the same thing which is like deconstructing a scene you know finding the beats finding the turning point knowing when to enter when to leave and understanding this on many levels informs each 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 kind of um field so they're super linked intricate they're the same thing and i think the more you do one the better you get at the other and i think writing helps my directing and directing helps my writing and editing helps my directing a ton producing you know having produced it allows you to be more, a little bit more budget conscious when you're writing understanding like what you can do what you can't do i think it's very important as well i think it's also important as a director to communicate with your producers who who have to do a certain job and you you have to do a certain job when you've been in their shoes and I I haven't only done those I've I kind of you know before I went to film school I just volunteered on sets so I've done almost every single job on a film set um, at at some point so you know I think just having an understanding of what every person's job is what every person's doing just allows you to be better certainly allows me to be a better director when I understand every almost every position on the set and, and what they're doing both above me and and kind of under me um so i think it's i think it's super important you know it, you, you should focus on one thing and, and practice and do that but to know to have experienced it at all brings a lot of added value absolutely fantastic mark thank you so much for joining us it's been a great discussion and um, you mentioned there's <coughs> going to be a theatrical release um in addition to the netflix where will that be so it's it's uh, 10 cities, and it is New York, L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, Philadelphia. I'm going off the top of my head. You got four left. Those are the ones I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta. 
Uh, okay, well, there a lot of cities. Uh, right. <laughs> well, well, how can people find out right, information and, uh, about it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that is a good question. I'm going to go and tweet that information out right now. And then they can go. check my uh, Twitter account at Mark Razzo okay. and they'll get all that information. Right. And we will retweet that information so you can find it at Mark Razzo or at Kodak. <laughs> and, um, and, and it'll be available on Netflix on Friday, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, April 20th will be available on Netflix everywhere. Excellent. Great. All right, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It was a great conversation. Megan and I love the film. Everybody, go check it out. Go to one of those theaters, and if it's not near you, check it out on Netflix. (laughs) Thank you so much, Mark. Great, thank you. It is a great satisfaction to be able to speak to you through the medium of this wonderful invention.